Yeah, thanks. So welcome, everybody. Um, I've got plenty of slides. It's difficult to actually discuss pediatric trauma uh, as well as trauma in general in 25 minutes. But I'll try my best just to be concise and uh, I'm not going to detail. Um, so yeah, let's kick off. Um, can I go ahead, Dr. Uh, Prof. Millen? Chitness? Yeah, please go ahead, please. Okay, so um, trauma is a prime cause of death um, and serious death throughout childhood and 40% of all deaths in the first world countries. And 50% of those are due to unintentional related deaths as a result of MBAs. And approximately about two thirds of injury are related to deaths are, are, are involving males. And uh, neurotrauma is the leading cause of all morbidity and mortality when it comes to trauma. And therefore it's very important for us to take a very careful history and an exam. Sorry, Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A neurotrauma related. Um, the reason being is that we've been receiving quite a lot of referrals with patients picked up in the street, patients who are unconscious, uh, not necessarily pediatrics, uh, not so much pediatrics, but adults that, uh, you know, get referred to directly to neurosurgery as a result of, um, uh, uh, of uncertainty whether the patient is, has been assaulted or was involved in the MBA because there's no collateral injury. But I'm not going to harbor on that information. Any child with a GCS less than 14 to 15 um, with clinical evidence of skull fracture or penetrating head injury requires an urgent CT brain. And um, trauma resuscitation, whether by ATLS, APLS, or ALS, um, is very important to prevent secondary brain injury and also important to improve outcomes in, 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 in pediatric patients with trauma brain injury. And it's therefore important that the triage team work together. They coordinate the management and resuscitation and direct the treatment of, 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 of patients with traumatic brain injury. Um, the other important factor is to try and allay the fears of the family and, and, and the parents by speaking to them, counseling them, and you know, keep them uh, 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 alert or aware of things that are happening and what management we are implementing. So we're going to look at the quick definition, acute brain trauma, brain injury, brain injury resulting from mechanical injury to, uh, as a result of mechanical energy, uh, energy to the head um, due to external forces. And there are three diffi uh, different categories um, or classifications, which I'll look at later. Um, mild traumatic brain injury where a patient is confused or is GCS 14 to 15. Mild traumatic brain injury, moderate traumatic brain injury where GCS is 9 to 13 and these patients usually are unconscious or stuporous. And severe traumatic brain injury where patients are comatose and GCS of less than 8. The epidemiology, about 75% of children admitted with trauma have a tra traumatic brain injury. And most of these in pediatric brain injuries are mild approximately over 85% are mild. Um, mortality of pediatric traumatic brain injury currently is recorded at between 10 to 13%. And these are international figures. I got this from my Australian paper. Um, and incidence is up to 125 cases per 100,000 population, especially of ages less than 15 years who are hospitalized. And those that we don't know of actually are not recorded. The male to female ratio is four to three. And uh, most common causes of pediatric traumatic brain injuries are usually due to falls from in, at our hospital, followed by MVA and PVAs. And obviously then followed by um, uh, uh, non-accidental trauma or what we call NAT or child abuse. Uh, Sorry, Kenneth, we are losing you. So, as I said, traumatic brain injuries. Um, plasticity of the skull makes it uh, very accommodating for these patients to, to sustain certain 
degree of injury and therefore we see these mild traumatic brain injuries and most of them actually just present with ping pong ball injuries especially those who are less than two years because the skull is so uh, pliable or malleable if that is a correct word I'm using. Um, the other rare conditions like post-traumatic leptomeningeal cyst also known as growing fractures can be problematic if, if, if one do encounter them and they do sometimes require surgery. And as I mentioned, patients, pediatric patients are quite resilient, so they can tolerate a certain degree of injury compared to adults. Um, classification of pediatric traumatic brain injuries. Classification of pediatric traumatic brain injuries is, is like adults. Um, it's mostly clinical, um, irrespective of what the radiological findings are. And unfortunately, those are the guidelines that have been laid forward from, from years of research. And everybody has agreed to the Glasgow Coma Scale, which has been long been used now. So the Glasgow Coma Scale uh, looks at three categories, eye, motor, and verbal. And the lowest points for each category is one. And in each of these categories, we look at the best response, but sometimes patients can present with confusing neurological findings. I mean, you can might find a patient who's decelerating on the one side of his arm and and is withdrawing or is localizing on the right other side of his arm. Um, and um, the other confusing uh, uh, factor that comes in play with uh, GCS is when it comes to patients who are intubated, who are, who are wearing masks, 40% mask, or um, are aphasic, then we use denote, uh, denotations or descriptors uh, to try and um, give reasons as to why there's a, a, a a, a, um, a drop in GCS and is due to verbal response. So T, M, or A, I use a subscript uh, uh, descriptors, um, and where T will be meaning tube, M will um, refer to mask, and A will refer to aphasic. But however, these, these are not variables. They do not replace the value one, which is the lowest value of V. So hence GCS 2T does not exist. And I think everybody has come to that agreement. Um, the problem with GCS in children, however, is when it comes to giving a total score, it's unable, we are unable to actually um, um, determine, determine what the value of V is because of patients who are less than two are unable to speak, or there might be limitations due to development delay or so forth. And this is just one example of a pediatric Glasgow coma scale that is in use currently. And as I said, this is not a, uh, a, um, a definitive Glasgow coma scale, but basically it's, it's just a guideline for us to use as to try and give um, some people just, some people just avoid the V and work out Glasgow coma scale out of 10. So it, I think the it lies with the neurosurgeon's preference as to how he wants to give the GCS. There's no lay down law. Um, when we look at mild traumatic brain injuries, we mentioned that 80% of children fall, fall in this category. And they usually GCS 14 to 15. Previously, it used to be 15, uh, but now they've included 14 to 15. Um, they may have loss of consciousness, amnesia, or neurological deficit, whereas the moderate traumatic brain injuries are. Uh, the incidence is quite uncertain. Um, um, it's found that 18% of all traumatic brain injuries fall in this category. And the severe traumatic brain injuries are less. Uh, they are approximately 2% of all traumatic brain injuries and they mostly comatose and they um, actually present with high mortality rate if they're encountered. Um, when it comes to management, so as mentioned earlier, management is quite important. So every trauma case that we deal with, irrespective of whether it's brain injury or general pediatric trauma or general surgery, um, the causes that we do, the advanced pediatric life support, advanced trauma life support, or ALS, advanced life support and basic life support, actually prepares us to manage these patients um, uh, 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 to manage, manage them promptly and also to direct uh, 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 appropriate treatment as a multidisciplinary uh, 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 team. So it's very important to then look at the ATLS pr principles or APLS principles and apply these when coming to trauma patients. 
And the reason being why we go through all this PT is to prevent secondary injury from occurring. Um, and when we talk about secondary injury recurring, we're talking about hypoxia, circulation problems that lead to hypertension that will decrease cerebral perfusion, hence causing further um, cerebral injury on top of the primary brain injury. So it's important that we apply these principles, whether the patient is GCS 14 out of 15 or severe, and which in most cases we use primary, uh, ATLS and, and APLS in severe cases, it's important that we look at the principles. So I'm not gonna go into detail. I'm assuming everybody is done ATLS or done some form of um, advanced uh, uh, learning. Um, I'm sorry for the background call. It's important, but right behind me is the COVID ward. So there, there's no more neurosurgical ward. Um, so in the secondary survey, we look at history, Um, the complete examination is important, uh, not where we apply the brief uh, disability neurological exam um, and do the investigations. So what are the indications for CT scan? So um, according to the trauma guidelines and uh, pediatric trauma guidelines, GCS of less than 14 in children, uh, that's an indication for CT scan. Um, some do mention that some articles or some literature do mention that a GCS of 15 with a local uh, a, a focal neurological deficit um, may also require urgency to scan, but that is also contentious. Um, um, some of these patients do well. There is no evidence to prove that such patients will have a better outcome, whether they had seizure, but I'll discuss that later when it comes to um, uh, simple skull base uh, fractures. Um, focal neurological deficit, signs of skull fracture, penetrating skull fracture, it all depends. And um, it's strongly considered if they're unequal pupils that we saw in primary uh, uh, survey. Uh, Anisocoria with one blown pupil and a normal reactive pupil that may indicate there's an intrasurgical lesion in the brain. Um, abnormal behavior, patients that are restless always consider that such patients may be hypoxic or they might be expanding lesion on the brain or cerebral, worsening cerebral edema. Penetrating injuries, open skull fractures, quite important and also depends on the mechanism and the object used. Persistent vomiting may also indicate raised intracranial pressure or worsening ICP. Um, Post-traumatic seizures depend on the on the lesion, uh, especially if it's delayed. If the patient never had seizures initially, one should actually do an urgent CT scan to, to find out why this patient suddenly had a seizure. Um, so the PCAN algorithm, which was actually implemented uh, to um, identify patients with uh, mild traumatic brain injuries who had uh, low risk for clinically uh, significant brain injury, uh, it's basically an algorithm to try and exclude whether a patient needs CT scan or whether we can do without a CT scan. Um, in the first category where patient A, GCS is 14 or other signs of altered mental, mental status, if it's yes, a patient requires CT scan, it's recommended. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole algorithm. You can have a look at it. Um, the, if there's no, one should then look at uh, occipital, parietal, or temporal scalp hematoma or history of loss of consciousness greater than five. No, CT not recommended. Patient can be observed for 24 hours and um, yeah, can be discharged home into the care of mother if the child is improved, obviously following the basic um, ATLS or APLS principles. In the category B, GCS 14 or other signs of altered mental status, no signs of space skull fracture if yes, the CT is recommended. A history of loss of consciousness with vomiting and severe may imply raised intracranial pressure. Then one should query and monitor and look at the patient and question whether observation versus CT. Um, this comes. This is where the neurosurgeon comes in, unfortunately. So if you, the the, the, the frontline doctor, casualty doctor, you obviously going to have to refer to the neurosurgeon at this point and. It, and then request their opinion, their expert opinion as to what to do for the patient. 
Um, and then obviously if it's no, then the patient doesn't need a CT scan and then clinically the patient can be observed for 24 hours and then be discharged. Um, management of traumatic brain injury. So patient, pediatric patients do present with different types of uh, uh, um, injury. Um, Cephalohematoma is one of the common ones that we find. Um, um, there may be subgaleal cephalohematoma. There are two types, subgaleal cephalohematoma, where there is, it could be or could be without any bony um, fractures. Um, this is bleeding into the loose areola tissue between the galea and the, and the, and the, and the epineurosis and the periosteum. Um, it may cross sutures. Um, transfusion may be required in these patients because they tend to expand. The mass is fluctuant and doesn't calcify. Unlike subperiosteal um, uh, hematomas, where it's common in newborns, they are firmer and less palatable or fluctuant, and they're limited by the sutures uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the periosteum, uh, with the periosteum attaching to the sutures. And 80% um, usually resorbs within, reabsorbs within two to three weeks. Um, this is a rare type of, uh, of skull fracture. Uh, Post-traumatic leptomeningeal cyst, I don't think you will ever see this. Uh, it's very rare. Um, uh, these are growing fractures. Um, fractures tend to widen. They appear as arachnoid cysts, and they do tend to um, breach the dura, and most of them require surgery. So these are the patients that you will have to refer to neurosurgery, unfortunately. Um, simple depressed skull fracture. Studies have shown no difference in outcome, uh, uh, in surgical outcome or non, uh, in outcome in surg versus sur surgical versus non-surgical treatment in 111 patients. And um, these patients usually, um, their skulls usually remodel. Um, so it depends on the institution, the resources you have, and obviously the presentation. If such a patient presents with a neurological deficit, then you'll consider uh, surgery. If it's seizure, um, unfortunately, lifting that fracture is not going to take the seizure. And you might find if you lift that fracture, there might be a contusion, there might be a gliosis or some form of uh, epileptogenic lesion on that brain, and the patient will then continue to get uh, um, anti-epileptic treatment despite the elevation of the fracture. So like I said, it's, it's very contentious. It's, it's all up to the surgeon and, and, and the guidelines that we, principles that we're following. Um, in this case, uh, such patient would not uh, require surgery, but I think we will observe and then treat for anti-epileptic treatment, load with 20 milligrams per kg of normal saline in 60 minutes and then observe. Uh, pediatric skull fractures, non-accidental trauma, also known as uh, child abuse. Uh, these usually occur in 10% of children less than 10 years of age. Um, the factors that are pathognomonic uh, for uh, non-accidental trauma are retinal hemorrhage, bilateral chronic subdurals in especially patients less than two years of age. One should be cautious when seeing patients with VP shunts. Um, it might be also that a chronic subdural may be due to overworking uh, VP shunts. Uh, skull fractures, uh, they may be comminuted, they may be bilateral, they may be, they may be multiple, they may be base of skull, um, they might be diastasis, diastasis meaning the fractures through the suture line. Um, so there's no specific pathognomonic um, sign for non-accidental um, trauma. They have to go through a lot of series of, 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 of investigations to try and um, uh, identify uh, the pathognomonic uh, uh, pattern or child abuse pattern. Um, and this needs urgent referral to neurosurgery as well as social worker. Um, I'm gonna go through the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines for severe traumatic brain injuries. So these guidelines are the latest guidelines that were formulated. Uh, I think these are the third edition of, of the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines for severe pediatric trauma brain injury, unlike the uh, adult ones, which are already on the fourth and um, 
we call it the living experience guidelines of the um, Brain Trauma Foundation. Um, so basically these guidelines are meant for severe traumatic brain injury. So the, this is where the neurosurgeon has now taken over the patient. The patient is admitted into um, ICU. The GCS is less than eight. The patient has been intubated, stabilized. Um, all the APLS principles have been applied and the neurosurgeon has now been called to take over management of the patient. Um, obviously, based on the radiological findings, um, uh, it will determine uh, whether the patient needs an ICP monitor. And the gold standard for the ICP monitoring is an external ventricular drain. There are other uh, ICP monitor catheter, but the gold standard is EVD that you can use both as a therapeutic and a monitoring agent. Um, the Brain Trauma Foundation has actually improved on the previous findings. They have made several recommendations. Uh, there are 22 evidence-based recommendations. I've just listed them. I'm not gonna go through them. Um, I don't think we have enough time and this is not the platform to discuss them, but it's just a guide for us to see what are the treatment uh, modalities for patients with severe traumatic brain injuries and what what are the latest evidence-based uh, 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 um, uh, uh, recommendations that are implemented. And these guidelines obviously will help us then uh, instate a protocol uh, based on our institution and also based on, 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 based on the resources that we have. Um, so looking at the first uh, guideline that looks at intracranial pressure monitoring, I hope you can see this uh, this table, I'm sorry, I, I actually uh, took it from the, um, directly from the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines. Um, it, 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 it is implemented at level three, um, where use of ICP monitoring is suggested um, and, and to, to improve overall outcomes. And where they looked at um, brain, uh, 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 the light box, sorry, oxygen tension monitoring as being uh, 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 relevant, but not important or not really that important when it comes to improving outcome, but it does kind of like support um, ICP monitoring. And um, uh, it, 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 hasn't a it hasn't got a direct, uh, 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 what is what I'm trying to say now? It hasn't got a direct link to the outcome of patient, but indirectly uh, assists in the treatment uh, of ICP monitoring and um, raised intracranial pressure to improve overall outcome. Um, neuroimaging, uh, it's also a level three. Um, it's where they looked at CT examinations. In the past, we used to just kind of like repeat do serial CT scans to see if the patient improved. But now it's recommended that it's not important anymore. The CT scan is only recommended where um, patient's condition has changed by, and I think most protocols these days looked at two GCS units. If the baseline was eight, GCS dropped to six, um, then it will be indicated. Uh, but serial CT scans are not recommended anymore. Um, the threshold of treatment, obviously, ICP target of less than 20 millimeters mercury. I think it's just slightly lower than what the adult was, 22 or 23.6, I think it was. Um, and obviously, it looks at uh, 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 CPP. In a past CPP, value of 60 millimeters mercury, I stand corrected, was the cutoff point, the lowest cutoff point. But now it's recommended that 40 millimeter, millimeters mercury is suggested. Um, the treatment recommendations of ICP, especially ICP greater than 20 millimeters mercury. Um, I think the hypertonic saline versus mannitol argument still carries on. Um, we do not have hypertonic saline available, so we make use of, of mannitol. And unfortunately, um, you know, we've just got into the habit of, of implementing ICP monitoring. So we haven't done it on kids yet, but we are gonna do that. Uh, we've been doing a lot of EVDs 
And I think I've got one adult patient, well, I had one adult patient with a EVD in SUTU that we did ICP monitoring directly to the ventilator monitor and uh, vitals monitor. Um, the EVD, as I mentioned, is very useful. You can um, use it for therapeutic uh, purposes as well as monitoring. If you monitor and see that the ICP is greater, ask the doctor or the ICU doctor duty or you yourself who are on duty to open the tap, let off CSF. Um, I think the recommendation is to let off CSF for about five minutes. Um, and then uh, you can close the tap and continue transducing the ICP. Uh, seizure prophylaxis, there's no difference between um, liver tyrosetum or capra versus phenytoin. So we do use phenytoin. Propofol is not recommended, whether for sedation or for, um, or, or for seizure prophylaxis or seizure uh, therapy. Um, because of a propyl infusion syndrome uh, if, if used over a prolonged time and at high doses. Analgesia and sedation, it's also a level three. Um, it is recommended, sorry, apologies. It is recommended that we um, not use midazolam and fentanyl. Um, I think this is institution-based. I think we use a lot of midazolam as here, but not fentanyl. Uh, midazolam and morphine for sedation. Um, uh, I think we use propofol more in adults. Um, however, we haven't seen any problems in using my desert, but they do recommend that we don't use it where there's a IC, uh, uh, ICP crisis because of the hyperperfusion that it can cause. Um, ventilation therapies. Uh, hyperventilation is not recommended anymore uh, unless you are intermittently taking a patient to theater and you're bagging the patient or you're gonna take a patient for a procedure or, or, or a investigation like a CT scan. And then, yeah, you can use uh, hyperventilation for brief periods. However, it is not recommended anymore. Um, hypothermia is a level two. Prophylactic moderate hypothermia is not recommended. Um, Barbiturates, the level three for ICP control. High dose barbiturates are recommended in hemodynamically stable patients. Uh, however, this must be uh, supplemented with continuous ABP monitoring um, as well as cardiovascular support uh, due to the cardiorespiratory uh, instability that it can cause. Um, decompressive craniotomy. Um, if all else fails, all medical treatment fails, uh, the patient requires a decompressive craniotomy, and then to put after a decompressive craniotomy, which we haven't done for kids yet. Uh, I, I, I haven't done one for a child. I must tell you because I've never done one for a child. Um, I have a, um, it is recommended to re treat refractory intracranial hypertension with neurological decline or where patients is about to herniate. Um, that should be continued with, uh, followed with continuous ICP monitoring uh, post-surgery. Um, nutrition level, it's, uh, to improve all outcome, it is recommended that enteral nutrition should be implemented or, or commenced within 72 hours post uh, severe injury. Immune modulating diet is not recommended. And obviously the uh, corticosteroid still remains the level three and it's not recommended in Henry injury based on the crash injury, the first study. Um, the key points to, uh, to take home, I think, is that pediatric and adult traumatic brain injuries differ. Um, more than 80% of pediatric traumatic brain injuries are mild and most require no CT. Uh, but observation and they can be discharged into the care of a patient of the family if they are, um, are stable. Uh, you discharge them with a head injury chart and obviously with counseling and, um, and uh, to inform the mom if anything goes wrong, you can visit the local base hospital or return back to the clinic. Um, all injured patients require approach and management based on APLS, APLS and ATLS principles. Um, remember, not all unconscious patients are neurosurgical related, and the best 
practice principles uh, based on PTF guidelines are the basis for protocol implementation. However, um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to, to kind of like try and improve the traumatic brain injury outcomes because of the lack of evidence of all the um, evidence-based recommendations that have been implemented. I think uh, that's my talk. Can I? Yeah. So th thank you very much. Um, I know you. Uh, it's a vast topic, and you had limited time. Uh, so, so thank you. That is that is quite um, uh, quite comprehensive. And uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, we've got consultants. So I'm just going to um, to uh, invite one after the other consultants. And obviously, then there should be plenty of time for uh, our juniors to ask questions uh, to Dr. Harrison. So I'll just invite Dr. Majola first. Dr. Majola, any comments, any questions? Hi, Prof. Um, thanks, Kerit, for a good talk. I think he's just covered all the sort of what I would wanted to know about management of acute uh, neurosurgical cases. So I don't have any questions currently. OK, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Majola. Uh, thank you. you thank you. Yashoda, Dr. Manik Chan. Please, any comments, any questions? Yeah, hi, Prof, thank you. And thanks, Kenneth, that was very helpful. I think our juniors uh, will find it very helpful as well when they're managing these patients. I would like to ask, out of interest, if they, yeah. what are the indications for evacuation of an extradural or subdural hemorrhage or hematoma in a child? Yeah, I know so there was one case recently, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so like, like, like we said in the classifications, you know, um, most patients, most of the pediatric patients that present with intracranial hemorrhages, uh, they usually fall in the severe traumatic brain injury category. So yeah. basically, these patients will be comatose and probably require, well, they will probably require um, intubation and, and obviously neurological fallout, clinical uh, def uh, clinical deterioration are all important factors uh, or indicators for surgery, uh, surgical evacuation of these patients. Mm. It's, rare, it's rare that you find a patient that you can sit with in a, a pediatric patient, may I say, that you can sit and observe with the extra dural, unlike the adults. The adults has got like a classification where you look at the size and look whether the, how much yep. midline shift is on the yeah. CT scan. But most of these patients are comatose. So, you know, from presentation onwards, uh, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't just sit with that extra dural hematoma. You have to evacuate. And obviously, you have to look at the, clinic, the, the overall clinical picture. Is the extra dural the contributing factor, or is there more cerebral edema, or mm. is there a diffuse picture to this whole uh, 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 presentation, you know? So, yeah. I, I hope that answers your, your, your question. So is, is it more, there's no absolute indication, but there's, there's no absolute indication per se. But like I said, it, it, watching it, for deterioration. You watch for deterioration and they do present clinically as being comatose, most of them. Some of them might have a very low, moderate traumatic brain injury where the GCS is between nine and 13. Um, even then these patients, it, it depends on what you find on the CT scan as well. Okay, all right, well, um, and then just one other question. Um, if you see, um, you know, in the shaken baby syndrome, you talked about the non-accidental. Yes, yes. We see, we suspect, you know, we should suspect uh, more often with children with brain, you know, traumatic brain injuries or like yeah. a decreased GCS, you know, and do you see diffuse axonal injury on the CT scan? If you don't see subdurals, obviously, you're, coup and contra coup. Um, oh, definitely. I mean, uh, if, if you look at, at, at the pathogenesis of shaken baby syndrome, it's yeah. mostly um, an angulated, acceleration, decelerated type of injury. The patient is yeah. shaken. The brain is moving up and down, back and forth in the skull. The inner part of the skull is very uneven. It's got a lot of ridges, bony ridges. And that's how the brain develops this punctate hemorrhages, you know, and uh, okay. because of the deceleration, and acceleration. Coming in? 
it's within the parenchyma, it's within the cerebrum. Yes, those yes. Those lesions, okay. Yeah, those punctate hemorrhages, and then you tend to see a diffuse picture from that as well. They'll have subarachnoid hemorrhages, they will have um, uh, 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 contusions, uh, they might or may not have um, subdural hematoma or extradural hematoma, depending on how the, 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 the shaken baby syndrome, was it against a hard platform or foundation or it was just in the air or something like that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay, thank you. And one more question about skewora. Is that something you see in children in, um, in our setting, maybe from, from MVAs and these acceleration, deceleration injuries? Um, yeah, skewora, uh, as, 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 as the definition states that these are spinal cord injuries without any um, radiological abnormalities. Uh, um, you, can, you, you, do, you do sometimes find them. Obviously, you have to go as far as doing MRI and uh, monitoring them and looking for other uh, clues uh, or, or, of spinal cord injury. And most children... Um, I think most children under the age of three are must have stated there. Um, they tend to have high. And so on the scan, going far as the MRI would probably help and sometimes you might or may not find uh, information in the MRI as well. So we don't see a lot of them to answer your question, but yeah, yes. they do exist, yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thanks for the answers to my question. Okay. And thanks for the talk. Uh, yes, thank you. There, uh, Kenneth, there are two more consultants, but before that, I would just like to read the questions which uh, Kirsty and Daniel have asked. So Kirsty wants to know which patients do we give mannitol to and at what dose? And do we intubate at GCS8 at Frere Hospital? Yes. Um, so, you know, I'd like to extend probably my answer to as far, not only as Frere Hospital, but I think our management um, extends as far as the peripheral hospital as well, Prof. Because yeah. I think our management should start with the primary physician who is seeing the patient. Um, so, you know, patients with GCS of 10, I tend to want to intubate them, do a forced intubation. Uh, reason being is because, you know, you can't trust the doctor on the other side as to whether they've done the things they actually have mentioned to you. Uh, that's one problem. And the other problem is that these patients can, um, without having a CT scan and without any of us having seen what's going on in the brain, these patients can have a seizure and that can be the tipping point for them uh, because a seizure can raise your intracranial pressure and um, according to the Kelly monroe scale, that could be, uh, that could lead to decompensation and patients can deteriorate very, very quickly. So I tend to advise that we intubate these speech patients when they are GCS around nine, let me not say 10, but a nine. That's a lower um, point for moderate uh, traumatic brain injuries. Um, and when they're gonna be transported to free hospital from a periphery, most of our patients come live two hours or more uh, 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 away from free. Um, if they come here and they're GCS of eight, they need to, they must, it's not need, they must be intubated. And reason for being th uh, is that we're following the principles of ATLS and APLS. We're trying to prevent secondary brain injury, which is up on the screen there. And um, preventing secondary brain injury improves outcome. And therefore it's very important for these patients not to be hypoxic. If a patient is hypoxic, cerebral edema will progress significantly. And the pressure in the brain will increase exponentially. So it's very important that they, in, they intubate it, very important that they ventilate it as well, not just intubate it. Appropriate ventilation is important. Make sure the cardio, the arterial uh, carbon dioxide is between 4.5 and 5, um, as per recommendation by the Pro, uh, Brain Trauma Foundation. Um, 
And uh, the other thing that I would like to extend uh, is that we should have uh, fluids available for these patients, but sometimes we don't even ask when the child has eaten, when the child has had a meal, or how dehydrated these patients are. Some of them come here without having bloods taken. So it's important that we speak to the primary uh, physician that's uh, initially seeing the patient and give them the appropriate management before sending the patient over to Freya. And it, and, it, it, and it improves hospital stay, number one. Patients don't have to stay here forever. Number two, some of these patients can be resuscitated, especially the mild traumatic brain injuries can be resuscitated in, in casualty. And then we can say, okay, we'll monitor for 24 hours and we send you home. But unfortunately, by the time they come here, things have gotten worse and now we have to look, fight for ICU beds and so forth. And, and it makes things difficult. And then this uh, practice management becomes impossible to implement, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you, Kenneth. I think it's it's very important that you are repeatedly mentioning about prevention of secondary brain injury. So that's very important. Can you just answer question about mannitol? So who to give and how much? Okay, so if patients are moderate traumatic brain injuries, so those are patients between... Um, uh, okay. I, I'm going to follow the Brain Trauma Foundations, uh, not what we're doing at the moment. So Brain Trauma Foundations, any patient GCS less than eight, we give mannitol. Obviously, it should be guided by ICP monitoring. Like I said, we haven't been practicing ICP monitoring due to the lack of uh, resources, obviously, and no ICU beds. We can't do ICP monitoring. Those ICP monitoring in the ward, uh, sorry, because ICP monitoring requires admission into ICU. Remember, these patients must be flat. They shouldn't have much of a peep. They shouldn't be coughing. You know, they shouldn't be moving around because these are going to all affect your ICPs and give you false um, or pseudo-raised uh, ICPs. So it's important that we have the facilities available to, to treat them with ICP monitors. So we give ICP a mannitol stat. Um, 0.5 grams to 1 gram per kg is important. I think we use 20% mannitol. So if you use a conversion factor in, in a 500 ml of mannitol, there is uh, about 200 grams per thousand ml. That comes to one gram per five ml. You can use that conversion factor to work out how much moles you want to give. All right. So you will take the one gram, multiply by the kg, and then uh, multiply by five to get you the total moles of mannitol. So GCS between... Um, uh, of less than eight is uh, mannitol is important. Okay, no thanks. And now Daniel has a question. When do we start prophylactic anti-seizure therapy if they never had a seizure? And if it's in babies and infants, do we still do phenytoin or phenobar? So when to start anti-epileptics and which is the drug of choice? So um, phenytoin is still recommended in, in, in all children. Um, it, it, Brain Trauma Foundation hasn't um, um, excluded phenytoin from any of the children, whether they're younger than two years of age or older than two years of age. I think um, we still follow the old school where phenobarb is used for the children less than, uh, I think, one years of age, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for infants. Um, but uh, there's, they've shown there's no difference between phenytoin and 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 uh, phenobarb, and obviously levotiracetam lev was recommended previously because it's a good monotherapy drug and uh, it's quite expensive, less uh, complications than phenytoin, but uh, based on evidence, there's been no difference in outcomes, whether you use levotiracetam or, or, I mean, the other name is Capra or Epinutin or phenytoin is the other name. Uh, phenytoin can be used across ages. Okay, my corollary to that question, Kenneth, is which children need long-term phenytoin following a traumatic so, brain injury? So, so Prof, if, if there's evidence of cortical contusion, okay. um, temporal lobe contusion, or any cortical injury that will act as an epileptogenic uh, 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 focus, those patients need phenytoin therapy, irrespective whether they've had seizures or not. So prophylaxis is recommended to try and avoid 
the early um, seizure from occurring within seven days. You treat it for seven days. Obviously, if there's no has, has been no seizure during that seven days, the um, treatment can be stopped. That's according to the recommendations. I see. Okay. If there's a seizure, we can carry on for a month. Okay. If there has been an early seizure, we can carry on for a month. But if a child has been seizure-free for a month, obviously, then we can consider stopping the, the treatment. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Kenneth. Yeah. Um, uh, I see. I think uh, Prof. Lazarus is uh, still here. Uh, so, so uh, Colin, do you have any comment or any question for Kenneth? Uh, hi, Kenneth. That was uh, hi, an, excellent an excellent talk. Thank you very much indeed. Thank um, you, Prof. I didn't know you were here. <laughs> oh, well, sometimes I don't know that either. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth, uh, what I wanted to ask was, you spoke about, about intracranial pressure monitoring. Yeah. And I just wondered if you could tell us how you place the ventriculostomy drain or the oh, yeah, ventriculostomy sure, monitor. Thank you. Yes, no, I'll briefly tell you quickly. Uh, so um, whether it's adult or children, uh, I think children above two years uh, where the skull is already formed and it's, uh, uh, it's fused, we use what we call a coccus point. So basically how you work out the coccus point, you can work it in different ways. Um, if, if you've got a trained eye, like a neurosurgeon who's been through a nat neuroanatomy, your coccus point will be your, pup your pupillary midline, that plane where it connects with your coronal suture. And then one centimeter anterior to your coronal suture on the pupillary midline uh, plane, um, that will be your coccus point. Or the other way, if you've got a ruler, you can use the, the, um, the, the sagittal suture, superior sagittal suture line, the midline of your skull, and measure from your glabella, glabella, sorry, which is just above your nasal bridge. Your zero point will be there. And going all the way back, uh, measuring about 11 to 12 centimeters, um, then marking your point from there, and then directly from the midline, three to four centimeters of your midline would give you your direct coccus point. So coccus point is uh, the point where we make a bow. Obviously, you will make your incision over that marking over the coccus point and uh, use a retractor, a self-retaining uh, retaining retractor or what we call a mastoid retractor. Um, strip the periosteum from the skull and then use a perforator. We've got mm -hmm. electronic uh, perforator make a hole in the bone, um, clear the, the edges of the bone, uh, and then do a cruciate incision. You can, you can use cautery just to prevent unnecessary bleeding. You just cauterize the dura and then use a incise, uh, make a cruciate incision on the dura. Um, and then the coccus point is directly over your anterior horn of your right lateral ventricle. We always use the right side um, because most patients are, uh, have a left dominant hemisphere and we do not want to affect language and speech. Um, so you'll be directly, if you go perpendicular in your coccus point, you'll be directly over the anterior horn of the right lateral ventricle. And on your ventricular drain, this is not a shunt, this is just the, the ventricular part of the shunt. Um, you will have markings and they're usually one centimeter apart. Um, that's to guide you how far you to go. So we usually use a five centimeter length distance. You'll be in the anterior horn. You'll see if there's backflow closed with a cork and then attached to a drainage system. Uh, there's usually a drainage system that uh, accompanies the ventriculostomy drain. Um, and obviously uh, it doesn't end there. You'll close your wound. Um, you will have to put the ventriculostomy with a little stylet, uh, a tunneler, very sharp tunneler. Put it sub subgalial, and uh, that's transdermal, and you will have to secure it onto the scalp. Um, we used to make we use you usually make a coil of the of the ventriculostomy drain and and staple it to the or suture it to the scalp. And once it's connected to the drain, make sure that your zero point of the drain, there's also markings and different uh, measurements. We use centimeter water mercury as our measurements. You can use millimeter mercury. 
It's got a rotatory measuring um, scale. Um, zero the drain with the external acoustic meatus or the tragus, the small pin of the ear. Um, and then there is a grading on the on the on the on the actual uh, measuring uh, or the drainage system. You set the 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 intracranial pressure, the level at which you want the CSF to drain. In other words, I like to say that that is your normal intracranial pressure. So if you set it at 10 centimeters water for a child, which or 15 centimeters for water for the child, which will convert to about uh, say 12 or 11 centi uh, centimeters water. So one millimeter mercury, mercury is equal to 1.36 centimeters of water. So once you zero set uh, intracranial pressure to 15 centimeters of water, anything above 15 centimeters water should drain out. In other words, you actually have now set a, 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 a point, a EVD point at which um, your normal pressure, anything above your normal pressure should be drained out. So when you couple it to your monitor, you're gonna to have to use a arterial bag, um, which will come separately. And you can, there's usually a three stop cock that you can attach the, the, the arterial transducer line with a pressure cuff. The pressure is increased to about 200 millimeter mercury on the 200 normal saline bag. Uh, I think our ICUs are only use a liter because their bags are big. The, the pressure cuff is huge. So you can use a liter bag and with the giving set, with the arterial giving set or transducer line connected to the stopcock. And there you can actually change the tap to drainage or you can change it to, transduce, to, 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 to transduction. In other words, monitoring ICP on the monitor without drainage. And I think that's a setup for EVD, ICP monitoring. Okay, th thank you, Kenneth. Thank you. Uh, Colin, any, any more comment, any question? Uh, thank you. No, Kenneth has given me the answer. Thanks very much. Appreciate no the talk, Kenneth. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, can it, we have a colleague from uh, Harare Hospital, University of Zimbabwe, uh, Dr. Taurai Zimunu. Um, I'm just going to ask him, Taurai, do you have any question or any comment, please? Taurai, you still here? Maybe he's not able to hear me. Kenneth? What's his name? Dr. Gororo? No, no. Dr. Taurai Zimunu. Uh, don't worry. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth, I think it's it's time for you to uh, to sort of give a final message before we conclude the meeting. So your final word. Yeah, I think um, we are faced with challenges at Free Hospital and it's been a ongoing, I think, for as long as I've been here. I think we've had a lot of problems. Uh, neurosurgery couldn't be on its own. And um, we've always tried to uh, complement each other when it comes to dealing with head injuries. I think the take home message was the key points that I've mentioned. Uh, and I think, um, you know, because we got a shortage of staff, we are going to be requiring um, our colleagues from the other disciplines like pediatric surgery and general surgery, just to try and be more accommodating when it comes to referring neurosurgery. So far, we've been receive, receiving a lot of patients that require us to work the patient up and from scratch. I just come from casualty now where doctors refer, refer the patient. It's an adult patient, not a pediatric patient. And we basically went to see this patient and we basically had to start working this patient up from scratch and found out the patient's got renal. So these are the things that are we hoping that our colleagues who are gonna be referring to neurosurgery would help us with. And I think uh, your assistance in pediatric surgery and, and, and general surgery is it's, it's greatly appreciated, Prof. Uh, I don't think I've got much to say and uh, the talk should talk to uh, speak to itself. Um, if we can just apply those principles, APLS principles, make sure that bloods are taken and patient, patients are stabilized, you know, and, and then um, 
I think we should have a good relationship, a working relationship in terms of trying to manage a, a traumatic brain injury or overall a multidiscipline or polytrauma patient, let me put it that way. Uh, I don't think I've got any more to say, Dr. Uh, Prof. Okay. Fitness. Okay, Kenneth, yeah. thank you. Um, we we have already had a meeting about uh, six weeks ago. Uh, so we, yeah. we promise, promise to work with you. And we also promise not to trouble you, uh, especially and Dr. Mack unnecessarily. And uh, I think this was like important step number two um, uh, in, in uh, working together. And um, I know you are studying, but uh, I will request uh, Dr. Pedersen from our department, um, maybe not in December, but maybe in January, under your guidance and Dr. Majola's guidance to try and formulate a standard operating procedure for emergency management of traumatic brain injury in children. So I think if, if by end February or so, we can get that out, then it will be there uh, for everybody to see and, and, and implement, um, in, including the interns who are working in casualty. So, yeah. yeah. Like I said, Prof, I, I just got bad news from Dr. Thomas as well today. I'm sorry, I uh, know Dr. McCunji said I shouldn't uh, talk about politics on this, but unfortunately, we can't avoid it. Um, there is a moratorium on all appointments, so I'm not sure when we're going to really? uh, develop yes. our department. Yeah. yeah, so I just no, got that bad news today. No, I know. Let's not, let's not discuss that. You uh, have given us a nice <laughs> talk, and let's uh, end on a good <laughs> note. Let's leave that topic yes. uh, outside uh, this meeting. So, Kenneth, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks, bro. Thank you, everybody, okay. for attending. And, and Kenneth, we wish you good luck for your studies. And, thanks, and we, thanks. we want you to pass as soon as possible. Thanks you very much. Thanks for your okay, support. Right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. So our next meeting will be uh, on the 19th of January, 2021. And uh, we will, you will obviously get uh, email um, uh, notification once you register through the Google form. Bye-bye.